Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Wassalatu wassalam ala Asrafil Anbiya wal Mursalin Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Amma ba'd Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh um, So today, um, Thursday 16th of April This is the second of two parts Of our look into um, The life of Sheikh uh, Ibn Thaymin And his service to um, Al-Islam um, you may recall uh, when we previously met um, in early April, about uh, just over um, 10 days or so ago, we looked at the Sheikh's early life and his um, pursuit of knowledge. Um, inshallah, we'll continue from where we left off. Um, and um, today, inshallah, we'll start with uh, his Sheikh's. Um, so when we look at Sheikh Thaymin, um, amongst his sheikhs and the, the most prominent, uh, he studied amongst a number of mashaykh, but the three prominent uh, sheikh under whom he studied were uh, Sheikh Abdurrahman al-Sa'adi, uh, his sheikh in Qasim, um, where the sheikh was born and raised up, uh, then Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, um, and he uh, studied under him when he came to uh, Ariyad, and uh, finally Sheikh Muhammad Al Amin Shankiti. <clears throat> you recall the story we mentioned um, about how the Sheikh referred to him as a, a Bedouin Arab in the way he dressed, and how um, they were surprised. They didn't know him, and they were just blown away by his um, level of knowledge when he. Uh, taught them. Um, so Sheikh Muhammad ibn Ibrahim al Sheikh, who was the Sheikh of Abdul Aziz ibn Baz, uh, at the time um, he was the, uh, the Mufti of Saudi Arabia and he appointed, having uh, heard about Sheikh Ibn Thaymin and his level of knowledge, um, he appointed uh, the Sheikh to be the head judge at the Sharia court in Al Ahsa. Um, the sheikh, uh, this wasn't something which uh, the sheikh wanted to uh, engage in. Uh, the sheikh was very, very keen to uh, dedicate himself to teaching as opposed to being appointed uh, a judge and presiding over cases, etc. So the sheikh politely excused himself and after a number of phone calls, uh, he was finally excused. Um, and thereafter, the faculty of Sharia and the Sul al-Din opened up in Qasim um, and the Sheikh uh, chose to transfer uh, to there um, to the uh, university, uh, Jamd al-Imam, uh, the, um, they opened uh, a, um, uh, how can you refer to it, um, the university they had a department there uh, the main one is in uh, Riyadh, but they had um, a smaller uh, university or their, I don't know, satellite um, university, you can call it, um, in uh, uh, Qasim. Uh, and the faculty there was Sharia and Usul al-Din. So he transferred from the Ma'ahad al-Ilmi and began teaching there uh, in Qasim at the Faculty of Sharia and Usul al-Din, and he taught uh, right up until uh, his death in 2001. So when Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Sa'adi, he died in 1958 at the age of 69, um, a number of sheikhs, they were appointed, uh, and Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Sa'adi, um, as I mentioned, he was the prominent uh, sheikh of uh, Sheikh Ibn Thaymin, when he died, uh, a number of sheikhs were appointed to lead the Salah and deliver the khutbah uh, at Sheikh Abdul Rahman's uh, masjid. But none of them really um, remained there for any significant period of time. Um, so Sheikh Ibn Thaymin, he was encouraged to assume the position. And amongst the people who uh, encouraged him and really impressed upon him the importance that he should uh, assume the role of the Imam and the Khatib. Uh, 
um, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Aziz al Matawa and also the governor of Qasim at the time, Khalid ibn Abdul Aziz al Salim. Um, and um, he uh, acceded to their request uh, and uh, began leading the salah at this masjid, at Sheikh Abdul Rahman's uh, Asadi's masjid, as well as delivering the khutbah. And he also, um, while he was there, um, he uh, taught um, classes. So um, from those of you who know the Sheikh students, they ran into many thousands um, from his time at teaching at the Ma'ahad al-Ilmi and then the Faculty of Sharia, in addition to uh, the Masjid uh, at uh, uh, the lessons there in Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Sa'adi's Masjid. And in total, mashallah, barakallah, the Sheikh taught for uh, just over 50 years, 50 years of uh, teaching. Uh, the Dean of Al Islam, and this is not uh, uh, not to mention that uh, he, he had a very popular um, summer program. Um, so when uh, school and university used to finish during the summer period, the Sheikh uh, would hold classes uh, from the morning after Fajr, uh, and then he would have classes at Asr and Maghrib, and this. Um, occurred uh, during the summer period uh, on a more full-time basis, but throughout the year, he would do the same, uh, but not uh, at the same level as he did during the summer. And students would flock uh, from all over Saudi Arabia and even beyond uh, to come and study uh, under the Sheikh. And um, Sheikh Saadi, his Sheikh, uh, his library in uh, his masjid was uh, extended by the Sheikh. And when uh, King Khalid, uh, who was the king at the time, he visited, at the request of the Sheikh, the masjid was uh, rebuilt and expanded. And uh, next door, the library was also, um, next door to the library, the Sheikh had student accommodation uh, built uh, to uh, accommodate all the students who would flock, uh, particularly for the um, summer classes, um, to offer them the accommodation. And I just wanted to share uh, a few examples of uh, the Sheikh's approach, really, um, in terms of being an employee. Um, when the Sheikh was teaching at the university, and something which uh, he was known for was. Um, his strict um, approach to uh, honesty. And uh, at the time, the university would provide uh, ink with which uh, students and teachers could fill their ink pens with and um, use for university purposes, whether it's uh, studying or marking papers or writing notes, etc. And as was the habit of the, of the sheikh before he left the university for the day, he would squeeze out all of the ink from his pen. And when asked why so, he, he said, my work at the university is over and this is the property of the university. So I have no need for it uh, be, be, beyond my uh, work. Um, and he was very concerned. And when we reflect, at the level of uh, honesty here, subhanAllah, and how many of us we are, or we overlook um, and in quotes abuse um, the, the right of our employers where we might make personal phone calls using the company telephone. Uh, we might take some pens or highlighters home with us um, give them to our kids. Uh, one of our children might ask, uh, Daddy, have you got a red pen? Don't worry, I'll get one from work tomorrow. This was the level of honesty of the Sheikh. And it gives us, uh, it, and it's nothing really new when you think about it, that uh, this is from the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, but how many of us have assumed those morals that we um, elevate our uh, morals to that standard 
uh, that we consider our employer's property, the, their property and not our own, that we can um, appropriate them or misappropriate for want of a better word and bring them home and use it for our personal uh, uses. And this is uh, not permissible at all, really, unless you have an arrangement with your employer, that's something different. But where uh, the standard is that work is work and home is home, we need to be very wary of these things. Um, likewise, um, from his, uh, from the Sheikh's uh, immense level of piety, mashallah, was that when he was absent from leading the Salah at the masjid we just spoke about, Sheikh Abdul Rahman Sa'adi's masjid in Runeza, um, since he received a salary for leading the Salah, as is the habit for all the masajid which are operated by the Ministry of Islamic Affairs, the Imam will receive a salary um, for leading the Salah and delivering the Jum'ah Khutbah. When he was, would be absent, as we know, um, it was the habit of the Sheikh, uh, more so uh, because of his rank, that he would be called for meetings with the Council of Senior Scholars if they were meeting in Ta'if uh, during the summer or in Jeddah or Riyadh um, in the winter, um, he would go and in his absence, um, someone else would lead the Salah. And he was very diligent. The Sheikh was very diligent. When he would receive the salary, he would deduct the equivalent amount uh, for the days he was absent and he would give it to the one who was appointed to lead the prayer in his absence. So not only was the sheikh absent from his duty in leading the salah, but he was careful to make sure that he would appoint someone suitable to lead the salah in his absence. And once he received his salary, he would then deduct the amount for the days he was absent and pass it over to the person he had appointed. In addition, um, as we mentioned, he was also teaching at the uh, university, as well as the Institute of Knowledge, the Ma'ad al-Ilm in Arneza. It was known of the Sheikh that if he was late by even a few minutes, he would make a note of it in the attendance register, for the, the employee's attendance register, and he would put next to it, biduni udr, i.e. that there was no valid excuse for his lateness even by a few minutes. You know, some of us in employment, we are employed from nine to five o'clock, for example. We might pop in maybe quarter past nine or five minutes past nine. How many of us did up that time out from our lunch hour? So we are all by law uh, given uh, an hour for lunch where we have come to work late by even two or three minutes. Are we really that honest? to the extent that we would reduce our lunch hour by those many minutes, so we are not indebted to our company. And this is the Sheikh, the Prophet taught us uh, the importance of honesty and halal income. And this is a Sheikh uh, emulating the teachings of the Prophet and how many of us fall short uh, in that regard? Um, Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ibn Muhammad Al Wahabi, he narrates a very nice um, story in which he mentioned uh, the Sheikh, he would refuse that portion of his salary for the lessons he was absent from teaching at the university, uh, his absence being due to his busy schedule. So, this is yet another narration that this wasn't something he would hide or go out of his way to keep under wraps, whatever. He's absent, he's absent. And um, you may find your employer overlook. But the sheikh was not uh, of that um, uh, thinking. If he was uh, absent from his lessons, then he wants that portion of salary removed from his um, uh, monthly salary uh, because he did not earn it. He was absent. Um, if we look, um, uh, despite the sheikh assuming uh, a position of teaching as early as 1954. And this was when he was at the age of 24, maybe 25. 
And this uh, brings me back to the point we just touched upon that when the Sheikh was appointed to be the judge in Al Ahsa in the Sharia court, the Sheikh's hunger, the desire, strong desire he had to teach, um, mashallah, Allah blessed him with a position at just the age of 24, 25, where he began to teach. And this was the um, intention of the Sheikh to impart the knowledge that he had, but he was not one who hastened to start writing books. Um, we might find some people, they uh, just want to rush into writing books or whatever. Uh, this is not the uh, habit of the Sheikh, uh, his mindset. Um, it was only 10 years after he began teaching in 1964 that the Sheikh published his first book. Uh, and that was Fath Rabbil Bariya Bit Al Khis Al Hamawiya, which was a summarization of Ibn Taymiyyah's Al Aqid Al, al Hamawiya. And the Shaykh mentions this um, as something along these lines in uh, the Book of Knowledge, uh, I believe it's page 67, where he says, and this is his advice to the students of knowledge, therefore, I do not wish to see the students of knowledge rushing to write books. Rather, I wish to see them as working students of knowledge, using every opportunity to call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to give dawah, to teach, to impart the knowledge they have gained. And this was his mindset, mashallah. So when the Sheikh first began to teach, um, there were very few, if any, students, maybe one or two. The Sheikh was not uh, particularly known at that time. Um, and sometimes, subhanAllah, even to the extent that there was no one except a book or two which had been placed uh, on the ground in the masjid just to reserve a student's place in the lesson. But subhanAllah, look at the etiquettes of the sheikh. The students may well be late, but the sheikh, he was undeterred. He would sit, he would remain seated, and he would read the Qur'an. Maybe he was revising his uh, hifad or his daily portion of Quran he's allocated or maybe extra recitation. Nonetheless, he was undeterred and he would sit there reading the Quran, waiting for even one student, even one student to arrive. And even when that student came, he would begin his lesson. It wouldn't be the case that Subhan only one today okay, um, I think we'll give it a miss. Um, when there's more of you, we'll come back. No, if that student, he has valued his time sufficiently to attend the lesson and the sheikh is already there, then he will give the student what he came for in terms of his knowledge. And on this note, Sheikh Hamad ibn Abdullah al jutaili he narrates, I have many memories of the sheikh since I studied under him over a period of 30 years in the study circles in Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Sa'adi's Masjid in Unaiza, al-Jami' al-Kabir. Even when there was only myself and another student in these study circles, Sheikh Ibn Thaymin, he remained patient at this until his study circles, they grew and were later attended by hundreds. And if any of you um, were able to see or oh, bear witness to his study circles in Makkah during Ramadan, subhanAllah, it, the, the students thronged to the Sheikh's um, classes uh, every, every day uh, during the latter part of uh, Ramadan. Um, and it's no surprise then uh, the importance he attached to imparting knowledge. The Sheikh had so much concern for his students, subhanAllah. On a particular occasion, when the regular students had not turned up for a lesson, at the beginning of the lesson, the sheikh, he asked about them out of sheer concern for their affairs, whether everything was fine. And this wasn't anything other than, as the narrator mentions, he was generally concerned, subhanAllah, is everything okay? Uh, he hasn't been involved in a car crash or anything. Uh, at home, is every, are all his affairs okay? He's missing the regular student. So he's inquiring about him. Um, one of uh, the Sheikh's uh, prolific students, Sheikh Khalid uh, al Mushaykh, who 
the sheikh married one of his daughters to him, uh, he narrates that the sheikh gave much importance to the affairs of his students. He was keen to assist in alleviating the difficulties which came their way while being on the path to seeking knowledge. In doing so, um, he allocated free accommodation for foreign students who came from overseas and he supplied them with all the necessary comforts from food, drink and whatever else they required. The sheikh, he would sit, and this was a common thing with the sheikh, he would sit with his students and he would ask about their affairs, how, how they are, how they are coping, have, have they been tended to? And he would listen to their problems, their needs and concerns, and he would try his best to assist them in alleviating their problems and needs. And if you look back, um, when he assumed the position of the Imam at uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Sa'di's uh, masjid, it was only after uh, the, uh, his sheikh's death that when King Khalid came and the relationships with the, um, the government and the scholars, mashallah, is so strong, mutual respect, and they, are, um, they seek advice from the mashaykh, and the mashaykh, mashallah, they uh, respond in kind and advise them, and they are very keen to help. And more so, as we'll see in one of the narrations coming up, uh, they you would divert any uh, funds which the, uh, the kings would offer them and the princes, and they would divert them to uh, better causes. And in this case, um, expanding the masjid, expanding Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Saadi's uh, library, and building a, a student accommodation for those students who would come. Um, from overseas. Um, clearly, accommodation is an issue. And the Sheikh, again, he was very keen to alleviate their, their difficulties in, the, in this regard. And um, poignantly, uh, Abdullah ibn Hamad al Rasailan, he mentions one of his students narrated an incident regarding the Sheikh, which deserves mentioning, whereby the Sheikh said, and look at the Sheikh's respect and level of, um, subhanAllah, uh, belief in his students and trust. And the Sheikh said to his students, there is a box in the students' accommodation building. And whoever needs any sum of money, then he can take it from there. SubhanAllah, can you imagine something like this happening today? The Sheikh had placed a box in the student accommodation building and it had money in there. And he said to the students, whoever needs any money, help yourselves. So the student who was narrating the story said, I went to this box as I had a need and I found it empty. And at that time I was in desperate need to travel and this required a sum of money. So then I went back to the Sheikh and I asked him for some money and with all humility and simplicity, he said to me, come with me outside of the masjid and I shall give you what you need. So I went out with him and he placed his hand in his pocket and took out a sum of money, more than what I was in need of, and he gave it to me. I understood from this that the sheikh did not want to cause me inconvenience and embarrassment in front of the other students, out of concern for my honor. Bayib, um, one of the things which um, we would, uh, would do uh, when we used to study Medina and um, we wanted to uh, benefit from the Mashaikh, uh, particularly for those students who are married and living outside the university, um, we would uh, see, seek out accommodation, private accommodation and it was a bonus if we could get um, accommodation close to one of our mashaykh uh, from whom we could benefit from maybe any lessons after Fajr or Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, whatever. We wanted to be close to um, the uh, mashaykh. So um, there's an interesting narration here where uh, once King Khalid um, 
he visited uh, the sheikh at his house. And as was the habit of the rulers in their regard and respect for the scholars. When the king, he saw the humble home of the sheikh, he offered to have a new house built for him, at which the sheikh thanked him. And he said, I'm building a house in the district of as um, in Umeza. However, now look at this, subhanAllah, the king is offering the sheikh to have a new house built for him because the house of the sheikh was like a mud hut. But the sheikh said, however, this is the case, I'm already building a house in that district. However, the masjid and the charitable trust, they are in need of financial assistance. So he directed or redirected the funds which the king wanted to give to have his house, new house built. He directed it for the needs of the masjid and the charitable trust. So after the king left, some of the students sitting around the sheikh said, oh sheikh, we did not know you were building a house, a new home in a salihiyah, to which the sheikh replied, isn't the graveyard in a salihiyah? So the sheikh, he was uh, trying to divert the attention of the king to something which he felt was more worthy of being financed, uh, the, the masjid and the charitable trust. And as for him building his house, we know from this that all of us are trying to build our house in our graves and in Jannah by engaging in righteous deeds. And this is what the Sheikh had intended. But what was interesting is how the students were in shock because some of them may well have been neighbors of the Sheikh or lived close by that they would visit the Sheikh with ease. And the Salihi is a, a greater distance away. And this caused them concern, just as it would when we were in uh, Medina and we lived around some of the Mashaikh. And if they moved, how that would um, cause us uh, sadness that they're not local to us anymore. Um, so in total, really, as I mentioned before, the Sheikh started to teach um, around 1953. And he continued to teach right through to 2001 uh, for 50 years. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Um, so let's move now uh, to uh, the Sheikh uh, at home with his family. Um, looking at the life of the Sheikh at home then, we know that the Sheikh was married three times. Um, the Sheikh's first wife, uh, she died, rahimahullah. And then the Sheikh, he divorced his second wife because he was very keen. The Sheikh was very keen to have children, but Qadrullah, uh, his second wife was unable to give birth to any. Uh, so he married, he divorced her and married her, his third wife. Um, and Allah subhanAllah blessed him with five sons from his third marriage and three daughters. Uh, his sons being Abdullah, Abdurrahman, Ibrahim, Abdul Aziz and Abdul Rahman, and the three daughters, each of whom he married off to uh, some of his prominent uh, students. Um, and subhanAllah, um, we would wonder then how would the Sheikh choose the names for his children? And his wife, Umm Abdullah, she explained after having chosen the names Abdullah and Abdul Rahman. He left the rest for consultation with me. So I would pick a name and present it to him for consideration. He would either agree or ask me to select another. Such was the uh, etiquette the Sheikh adopted with uh, his wife in choosing the names for each of his uh, children. Um, amongst his siblings, then the Sheikh had two brothers, Dr. Abdullah, who uh, is the president of the history department at the University of King Saud in Riyadh, and also the general secretary of the King Faisal Award for Services to Islam. And the Sheikh had a second brother called Abdul Rahman. Uh, when we reflect on the hadith uh, transmitted by a Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah, khayrukum khayrukum li ahlihi wa ana khayrukum li ahli. The best of you are those who are the best to their families, their wives and their children. And I am the best of you to my family. And the Sheikh's eldest son, Abdullah, in light of this hadith, he recalls the Sheikh's relationship with his wife. And that being of one of mutual love 
and respect. And he said, as children, they, we never knew our father to have ever raised his voice at our mother or anything of the sort. If anything, look how the Sheikh's wife, she refer, refers to incidents which used to happen at home. She said, regarding my anger with the children, when I used to uh, get, they used, maybe they irritated her or whatever, um, regarding my anger with the children, the sheikh, he would try to calm me down first. And after calming me down, then he would turn and give the admonition to the one that was mistaken or who had um, uh, done something uh, which required uh, admonishment. Even after the children grew up, the sheikh, he would instill in them extreme respect for their mother and spoke of her exemplary character towards him particularly when he began seeking knowledge and he was preoccupied with his studies. He appreciated his wife's sport immensely and made that known even to his children. The more the Sheikh pursued the path of knowledge, the more he, busier he became, but he never forgot his wife's commitment and support for him and his efforts in seeking knowledge and teaching and giving da'wah and sitting on the various committees like the Council of Senior Scholars wherever they would meet, he would travel. And this is particularly so since his wife had assumed much of the responsibility for nurturing them as they were growing up when the Sheikh was absent. Not that he was absent for weeks on end, but just maybe he traveled for a few days to the meeting uh, with the Council of Senior Scholars and elsewhere when he was required, but he made his base, uh, his home, and where he worked in Reneza. This is just when he would travel uh, with respect to his duties um, for the various committees he was part of. And the Sheikh, when you look at their life um, together, SubhanAllah, you could see from that which you, you read that she had his back covered, supporting him without any complaint. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. She was always her nature was one of always being um, at the service of her husband in the good that he pursued being at the service of the deen. The sheikh's wife, mashallah, was an exemplary wife. Just as the sheikh reciprocated her commitment and support for him by exemplifying his appreciation for her in this regard. In addition to the to his appreciation for his wife's commitment and support, the Sheikh would always seek her advice in matters related to the household. So let's say, for example, if the children, they ever approached him for anything, anything which he would maybe had little or no background about, he would direct them to their mother saying, go seek your mother's permission, or you must go and see to your mother and ask her. He would always be sure to accompany his wife on any journey that she made, just as she would accompany him. So the Sheikh was one of, um, he wasn't keen to impart the, his responsibility towards his wife to any of his children. Uh, if she needed to travel, he would make sure that he made himself available to accompany her. And likewise, she would accompany him. She even accompanied him to America when he traveled there for a period of 10 days seeking medical treatment for his cancer. And once again, subhanAllah, you cannot uh, but really uh, be amazed at the exemplary role models they were of a husband and wife union, mashallah. Um, and every Friday, mashallah, after the Jum'ah Salah, um, the Sheikh would maintain um, a family gathering, uh, make sure that he would attend the family gathering where they would go uh, out for a picnic, uh, which his wife would prepare the food for. And even after the children grew up and they were married and settled in their own homes, he would still, they would still gather together. Uh, their eldest son, the Sheikh's eldest son, Abdullah, he had built a villa, a recreational villa, where all the families, they would gather um, and the Sheikh would uh, join them. 
and the sheikh was known to swim and he would swim with the uh, with his children and his uh, grandchildren as well and take part in the uh, family gathering alhamdulillah give the family their time and one of the most important aspects of the sheikh's nurturing, when we look at um, the sheikh's approach with his children, so we've spoken about the sheikh's um, life with his uh, wife and how much support she gave him and how he reciprocated that with her. When we look at the sheikh's approach to his children, um, one of the most important aspects of the sheikh's nurturing of his children was the importance uh, he attached in building each of his children's self-confidence. So if any of his children, um, let's say, were exposed to any problem, he would not jump in and try to resolve it for them. He would allow them to continue to um, undergo the experience um, so they can build up their self-confidence in dealing with issues. And if they were unable to uh, uh, overcome any of these problems, he would not intervene until the very last moment where he, he would have to. He was very keen that they would taste the hardship, you know, how their mind would um, try to work out a solution. He wanted them to taste that so that tomorrow when they are uh, presented with another problem, because of their experience, they're able to handle it. There's a famous saying of one of the Mashaikh, it is not our job as parents to protect our children from the thorns that come across their paths throughout their lives. The thorns meaning the problems that may befall them. Uh, it is not our job as parents to protect them from these thorns. Rather, our job as parents is to teach our children how to cope when they are pricked by these thorns. Beautiful, mashallah, words which carry immense meaning. And as parents, alhamdulillah, we can all appreciate the value of these words. So we learn from this, the importance of instilling uh, self-confidence in the children that allow them to try and resolve their problems. And only when, it's too, when it becomes uh, risky that, you know, uh, the sheikh would at the last moment intervene and offer his guidance. The Sheikh's wife, um, Um Abdullah, she mentioned um, the Sheikh, he used to deal very justly uh, with his children in all the affairs, major or minor. And if he found any kind of distinction between the children, he would never declare it openly because this is not um, from justice. So he would not overly praise any child and um, allow any of his children to feel that they are the most special and the others aren't. He would treat them all uh, equally. And there's a lovely narration I came across, which I hadn't until I, I read the sheikhs, um, this anecdote from the life of the sheikh. Um, there's a hadith um, in Sahih ibn Hibban. And uh, it, it is as follows Muharib ibn Dithar Qala sami'atu Jabir ibn Abdullah Yaqul kunna ma'a Rasulillahi Sallallahu alayhi wa sallama Fi safarin qala Falamma ata al-madina ta amarahu An nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallama An yati al-masjida Fa yusalliya raka'atain So Muharib ibn Dithar He said I heard Jabir ibn Abdullah Say we were with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam On a journey and he said, when he arrived in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ ordered him to go to the masjid and pray two rak'ahs. And this was before he entered home. And I only came across this narration when I looked at the, uh, this uh, anecdote of the sheikh. And it was narrated um, as follows. Once the sheikh returned to Anaza, his hometown from his travels, and found the masjid closed. So he began going from one masjid to another masjid until he found one masjid open. And therein he performed the two rak'ahs in accordance with the established sunnah of the Prophet 
when he entered a town, he would start by recite by performing two rak'ahs in the masjid. This particular anecdote led me uh, to this particular hadith, which I have shared with you. Um, we are moving now uh, to the uh, last aspect of the Sheikh's life, and this is um, his illness and death. And if there are time restrictions, um, please, uh, Akhi uh, Zakaria, please let me know. Uh, we have, I think, maybe another 15 minutes. Um, tops 20 inshallah if there is any issue then please let me know otherwise we will continue inshallah now you're completely fine Ustad. Okay. so um at the beginning of the uh third month uh rabi al-awwal in the year 2000 um the sheikh noticed some changes in his health and from amongst the changes um he noticed that his eyesight was weakening so he traveled to uh, Riyadh with his eldest son, Abdullah, to have his eyes examined at the National Guard Hospital. And it was then that the Sheikh disclosed to his son that he had some other health issues he would like to have checked out. And since they were already in Riyadh, he would like to have a complete medical health checkup. So his son, mashallah, he assured his father that that really wouldn't be a problem since they were already in Riyadh, they will return back to the hospital the following morning for the full checkup, inshallah. So after the Sheikh's checkup the following morning, the doctors discovered the presence of cancerous cells. And the Sheikh's family were absolutely shocked with the news. Naturally, as is the case with all cancer patients really in their families, um, it was something the Sheikh's family had never expected. And what compounded their shock was that these cancerous cells, they were actively spreading. Um, so the Sheikh, um, undeterred by this um, shocking news, he continued as per normal with his regular plans of holding his summer uh, 2000 classes in his masjid, the masjid of uh, his Sheikh. Uh, Al-Jami' Al-Kabir in uh, Qasim, and despite this news, there was no signs, there were no signs uh, of him taking a rest or easing back from his active schedule. It was noted that since the news of his affliction with cancer, the Sheikh did not cut back on any of his commitments, subhanAllah, even though he has an excuse. The Sheikh was apprehensive about receiving chemotherapy um, for his cancer because he had heard that um, the chemotherapy treatment, it causes the patient's hair to fall out. And he, he did not want to lose any of the hairs on his beard. It was something which was beloved uh, to him because it was from the um, manner of the Prophet ﷺ to let the beards grow and trim the moustache and he did not want anything to uh, harm his beard, any hairs to fall out. Um, this is why he was very apprehensive about receiving uh, chemotherapy treatment. And despite receiving treatment for his cancer though, the Sheikh had exhausted all avenues for the treatment of his cancer in Saudi Arabia. And he was encouraged at uh, that stage to travel to America to seek advanced cancer treatment. And many of those who love the Sheikh, amongst them his family, um, his friends, even King Fahad, and then Prince Abdullah, who later became king, and Prince Sultan, they all called the Sheikh personally, urging him to travel to America for medical treatment. But the Sheikh, he turned them down, they, he turned down their requests saying that we have hospitals here in Saudi Arabia, mashallah. So one morning, um, the Sheikh Saudi's son again, Abdullah, he entered upon him whilst he was sitting on the floor in his library and the Sheikh, he was writing and drinking Arabic coffee. And one of the things, um, if you ever see the Sheikh in his, um, his pattern, when he was at home, he would allocate time at night to respond to the questions people had written to him. He didn't have a secretary. 
who he would dictate to, he would write by hand the response to the people who wrote to him. So here the chef was sitting uh, on the floor in his library, writing um, and drinking Arabic coffee. And Abdullah, he turned to his father and casually pleaded with him, oh father, come on, let's just go and have a look. There's no harm in going. He's referring to go to America. Maybe they have different treatment over in America, which we don't have here in Saudi Arabia. Come on, let's travel. In response, uh, the Sheikh turned to his son. He lowered his head to look at him from above his spectacles since he was um, writing. And he spoke a few words, which Abdullah will never forget. He said to him, son, this illness is something which Allah has decreed upon man. This illness is something which has afflicted kings, princes, scholars, politicians, the old and the young, and presently no one has been able to treat cancer. So all praise is due to Allah alone. I have lived a life longer than that of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by 11 years. I ask Allah to have blessed it. And it was at that point, humbled by his father's response, Abdullah got up and left. And he mentioned that at this point, I understood from this man, my father, that he was completely calm and at peace with what Allah had decreed for him. Eventually, the, the Sheikh succumbed to all these requests and decided to travel to America for treatment, staying there for only 10 days. But subhanAllah, look, if we go back to how I started this uh, session today, how um, Sheikh Muhammad Ibrahim al Sheikh, he had uh, appointed Sheikh Ibn as a judge at the Sharia court, but the Sheikh turned down his request, excused himself because he was just so keen on teaching. And look, when he went to America for treatment, even in the spare moments around the treatment he received, the Sheikh was so busy. He was teaching at the local American uh, Islamic centers via Telelink, as well as holding classes inside the hospital and responding to those who called or visited him and sought questions for Tao from him. This was the Sheikh always active. You'd think, SubhanAllah Sheikh, you uh, have cancer. You know, you of all people have an excuse to ease up and rest. But no, the Sheikh is just working, working, working all the time at the service of Islam. Um, Sheikh Badr Ibn Nadir al-Mashari, he narrates, when the Sheikh returned from America, after receiving medical treatment, he was asked about his health and condition. So after the 10 days, he's just returned and he was asked about his health. So the Sheikh, uh, this Sheikh is actually, Sheikh Badr is saying that we asked uh, him, so the Sheikh told us some words which are worthy of being written in gold. And the Sheikh says, no, that both illness and good health do not come before or after their decreed time. Indeed, my time has been written and your time has been written even before Allah created the heavens and the earth. So believe in this, for certainly I have believed in this. And then Sheikh Badr narrates another um, incident where despite the ill health of the Sheikh, he was steadfast in delivering the Jum'ah khutbah in uh, the masjid in al Jamil al-Kabir, as well as leading the Salah and meeting the people to answer their questions and inquiries. And all of this in spite of what he was going through himself, such that it was said to him, you must rest, O Sheikh, to which he replied, resting is in being the service of the Muslims. And one of the things was noted uh, about the Sheikh and these little uh, anecdotes uh, relating to his time during his illness, it was noted um, that uh, as the Sheikh's uh, health deteriorated, he was prescribed with painkillers. And one of the doctors who was treating him said that he, the reason why he detested them, 
us, subhanAllah, we have a headache, something's causing us pain. Um, after we recite the, uh, the authentic hadith, the supplication, uh, after we do that, some of us, we tend to uh, take some um, paracetamol, uh, painkillers. But the doctor treating the sheikh said that the reason why the sheikh used to detest these painkillers is because they caused him to sleep. And as a result, it would prevent him from teaching and standing the night in prayer. SubhanAllah, this man, he has all the excuses. The sheikh, he has all the excuses to rest and take it easy because he's an ill man. But he is still hungry to teach the people as well as standing the night in prayer, SubhanAllah. In this particular narration, um, and this was just a year before the Sheikh died, uh, Muhammad Rabi' Suleiman, he narrates um, a year before the Sheikh died, there occurred a memorable incident during the month of Ramadan whilst the Sheikh was giving his daily lessons in Al Masjid Al Haram in Makkah. So the specialist doctors who were supervising the Sheikh's condition, they advised the Sheikh. Um, that his condition necessitated rest. So he must rest uh, on that particular evening rather than giving a lesson after the Tarawih prayers. So the doctors, they said, we need to give you a, a blood transfusion, do some medical checks. And in response, the Sheikh said to them, do what you have to, as I am going to give the lesson. So the Sheikh was undeterred. He was happy, and the Sheikh, mashallah, they'd allocated him a room in the haram, and um, the room is where he would meet the students or, from, or the people from wherever they came during Ramadan, and they'd break their fast with them. And we did, uh, we met the Sheikh there back in 94, when we uh, broke our fast with the Sheikh, and this was uh, appointed uh, um, for the Sheikh. Uh, during Ramadan, where he could use it like a personal space to uh, meet and greet the, the people who'd come to see him. That particular room, it was converted um, to allow the medical equipment to be there and for the doctors and the male nurses to tend to the sheikh while he was uh, um, needed to receive medical treatment, while the sheikh wanted to give the lessons. Uh, his regular lessons in uh, the haram. So the sheikh said to them, do what you have to, as I am going to carry on uh, with the lesson. So while the sheikh was giving the lesson, unbeknown to the, 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 the gathering uh, outside in the haram, the doctors were around the sheikh, putting a needle into him to initiate a blood transfusion and then complete the medical checkup, checking his temperature, pulse and general health. All of this was taking place while the sheikh insisted on uh, giving the lesson. Such was the level of importance the sheikh gave to spreading knowledge and teaching the people right up until the last night of Ramadan before his departure from Al Masjid Al Haram. And at the end of Ramadan, when you think about it, all this has took place, it was only two weeks later the sheikh died, subhanAllah. So during the final stages of the sheikh's illness, he was approached in Mecca, and it was said to him, O oh, Sheikh Muhammad, we do not know who will die before the other. So if you were to die before us, then to whom should we direct our questions seeking fatwa in issues of fiqh? Give us the names, O oh, Sheikh. So the Sheikh responded, Ask Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan, for indeed he is a faqih and an upright and religious man. In addition, he suggested two further names, Sheikh Abdul Rahman ibn Nasir al barraq and Sheikh Abdul Aziz al rajhi SubhanAllah. Um, as well as having taught in Al-Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca for over 35 years, so of the 50, uh, just over 50 years, the Sheikh taught 
uh, in his life. 35 of those years, Allah blessed him to uh, teach in Al Masjid al Haram. In addition, the Sheikh was blessed to have led the Taraweeh prayers in Mecca in Al Masjid al Haram on three occasions. The Sheikh Rahimahullah died at the age of 72 years, or in Hijri term, the years is 74. And he died on Wednesday, 15th of Shawwal, just two weeks after Ramadan. And this corresponded to the 5th of January, 2001. And Alhamdulillah, we were there um, when the Sheikh had died and we traveled uh, with some companions um, to Mecca for the Sheikh's funeral. So he died on Wednesday and his janaza uh, took place on Thursday, the following day after Asr. So that day we traveled the night and we visited Sheikh Rabi and spent the night at his uh, house resting in his library. And the following day we prayed Asr in Al Masjid Al Haram, followed by the funeral prayer over the Sheikh. And after the funeral prayer, we returned to Sheikh Rabi's house where the Sheikh he was receiving guests that Thursday afternoon. In, in, interestingly, um, uh, while we were sat there, the Sheikh, uh, he informed us, um, you may recall Sheikh Mukbil in Yemen, he was of poor health and he had contacted or people around the Sheikh had contacted Sheikh Rabi and um, to see if he could help. And Sheikh Rabi, uh, he was uh, wondering what should he do? Who could he turn to for help? other than Sheikh Ibn Thaymin. So the Sheikh, he called Sheikh Thaymin and explained to him the situation concerning Sheikh Muqbil. And Sheikh Thaymin asked him to call him back in 15 minutes. So after 15 minutes, Sheikh Rabi' called uh, Sheikh Thaymin back. And Sheikh Thaymin told him to inform Sheikh Muqbil to promptly travel to uh, Saudi Arabia, where the Sheikh had interceded on his behalf with the interior minister, Prince Naif, who had assumed total responsibility for Sheikh Mukbil, including all the financial burden for his time in Saudi Arabia and the USA while seeking medical treatment. And Sheikh Thaymin, or rather Sheikh Rabi, recalled how helpful Sheikh Thaymin had been and how quick the Sheikh was to um, intercede on Sheikh Mukbil's behalf. There are so many um, little stories uh, left to share, and I'm very aware of the time uh, allocated, uh, but I do encourage you all uh, for your benefit. Um, there's a book called Jusa Guidance, in addition to the, those which have been published on Fatwa Online, about um, Sheikh Ibn Thaymin, likewise Sheikh Ibn Baz and Sheikh Albani, read from them, and learn more about your senior scholars and the life they gave in service of Islam and how they uh, held fast to the Quran and Sunnah, undeterred by what was going on around them, their health and their situations. And subhanAllah, um, particularly since they were of our time, such a profound message in their lives, mashallah, tabarakallah. Um, as I said, there's plenty of others. I mean, I'm now on um, page 23 and we have another 12 pages um, of uh, notes to share. But I will finish, inshallah, uh, today. We've mentioned the Sheikh's death. And I would just like to finish on um, one final uh, bit of advice. Um, Allah has blessed us to have um, looked into the life of Sheikh Muthaymin and, and his life in the service of Al-Islam. But before I close, I just wanted to share with you an important question which was asked of Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan. And the question is, when one of the senior scholars passes away, some of the operators of the satellite channels who intend good they resort to filming the place where the Sheikh would hold his lessons, his masjid and his mimbar upon which he would give khutbah. And the Sheikh responded, this is not permissible. This is not permissible. 
this progressively leads to ghulu, excessiveness towards the pious people. And ghulu towards the scholars, these things are not permissible. Regarding the scholars, then their works, their books, their lessons, their recordings, and the knowledge of the way they spent their lives are all that remain. As for his member, his house, then there is, of no, ben there is no benefit in any of this. What benefit is there in knowing about his house? He has died. That's it. He has died. Therefore, whilst I do not have the privilege to have studied directly from the Sheikh, I have had the privilege to have met him a number of times and sat in his gatherings in Al Masjid Al Haram, in Al Masjid Al Nabawi, and the Islamic University of Medina. Um, I, like many others, have also benefited from his numerous audio recordings. And while he was not my teacher in person, he was through his books and audio recordings. So in closing, I would just like to repeat the statement of Al-Imam Al-Hakim, who said about his Sheikh Al-Hafidh Abi Ali Al-Nisaburi, I do not say this as a dedicated fanatic, since he was my teacher, but I simply never saw anything comparable to him. I pray that good thoughts whatever good thoughts you had of the Sheikh have now multiplied in terms of love and respect for the Sheikh in what he strove uh, in the service of uh, Islam. And anyone who held bad thoughts of the Sheikh, then I, pr then I pray really, these have now been removed and turned to love and respect, insha'Allah. Wa nasallahu lana jami'an wali walidina an yaj'alana mimman idha u'atiya shakar وَإِذَا أُبْتُلِيَ صَبَرْ وَإِذَا أَذْنَبَ اسْتَغْفَرْ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَى نَبِيْنَا مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَّ وَبِحَمْدِكَ أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ أَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْكَ